I'd now like to invite Ashley up to lead us in prayer. given us, that you've given us rest from work and from school and all the things that we're doing in our daily lives, that you help us rest spiritually and physically and mentally. Lord, I thank you for everyone involved in the service today, and I pray that whatever words are spoken will be filled with your Holy Spirit and your love. Lord, please teach us something about you, teach us something about ourselves, and please change us into who we need to be. I pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. I'd like to welcome you all to the second part of our morning worship service. I hope that you had a good discussion in the lesson. Um, And I'd like to just give a warm welcome to all our visitors that might be here, and a special welcome to Ashley and Jono. Also, just a short reminder that we have lunch in the hall after the service, so you're all welcome to join. Now I just want to share a few words as a short devotional. So if we look at John chapter 15, verse 16, it says... You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. In this verse, we see how much Jesus loves us. It's so helpful to be reminded of this truth. Sometimes you might question whether God really loves you. Perhaps you doubt if he will do the same things for you as the accounts you read in the Bible. But here's the truth. Jesus loves you. He chose you. But why? Because he loves you. He sees your potential and value in him. And because of that, we have the ability to ask and pray for things. It says that whatever we ask in Jesus' name, the Father will give to you. Now, if you ask for a brand new car or something like that, it doesn't mean that God will always give you that. But if you desire things that line up with his will for your life and line up with God's word, you can expect that God will give those things to you. Sometimes you question whether your prayers will be answered. You doubt the ability of God to perform such great miracles that you hear about in other people's lives. But it's important to remember that God loves you so much, and it may feel like he doesn't answer some of your prayers, but it may not be a part of his will for your life. Whether or not they're answered, God is watching over you and looking after you. So today, don't forget that you are loved. Decide to let that love rule your life, and as a result, don't be afraid to ask and pray for the things you need. I would now like to invite Gabriella to do verse for offering. Um, in Deuteronomy 8.18, 8, um, it says, You shall remember the Lord your God, for it, it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. Tithing is much more than money. Faithfulness in tithe reveals our loyalty to God. One of the reasons God confronts us in specific tests in our Christian life is dependent on our faith. Our faith grows at the point of the test, and when there is no test, there is no growth. Throughout centuries, the great heroes of faith were challenged to grow at the point of the test. I'd like the deacons to come and collect the offering.
Our gracious Heavenly Father, what a blessing it is to be in your house of worship today and to be called the children of God. We put before you these tithes and offerings, symbolising our total commitment to you. We ask that your name may be glorified and may these offerings be used to spread the word of Jesus. We look forward to meeting you soon. I pray in your precious name of Jesus. Amen. Now it's time for the kids' story, so if all the kids could come up as Kayla shares the story. story is called Because She Smiled. Grandma had a very unusual hobby. You'd never guess what it was. She collected money, not for herself, but for the missions of her church. Despite her age, she was always top of the list and could run rings around the younger members. When she went out with a group of collectors, many of them much younger than herself, she always came back with the most money. Everyone wanted to know her secret and she wouldn't tell. I think she enjoyed being known as the best collector. Then one day, her granddaughter, Peggy, said she would like to go out collecting with her the next time the church had a collection for missions. Grandma said she could, and they went out together. But Peggy didn't do very well. She came back with only a few coins. During the same time, however, her grandma had collected $60. How do you do it? asked Peggy. Everybody seems to throw money at you. I tried so hard, but look how much I got. It's very simple, said Grandma, if you know how. I wish I could do it your way, said Peggy. Well, said Grandma, I'll tell you what. Tomorrow I'll come with you and watch what you say and do. Then maybe I'll have some ideas. The next day they went out together while Peggy went up to a door. Grandma stood by watching and listening. When they returned home that evening, Peggy was still upset, having only a very small sum of money. I don't think it's worth it. What did I do wrong, she said. You may find this hard to believe, said Grandma, but I'm more interested in people than in money. When I go to a door, I never think, how much money will this person give me? But rather, how much good can I do them? I know that most people are either tired or sad or worried, and all of them need a kind word and a smile. Give it to them, cheer them up, and they'll give you more money than you ever hoped for. Well, I do try and be nice to everybody, said Peggy, but not nice enough, said Grandma. I watched your face. Most of the time you looked scared. Hardly ever did you give people a friendly smile. You reminded me of the man who tried to sell fruit from door to door, but he was always in a bad mood and nothing ever sold. Peggy was thinking hard. But how do you love people you've never seen before they even open the door? She asked. Try to think of their needs, said Grandma. The lady who comes to the door may have a headache. She might be overworked, trying to look after children. She may be rushing to get a meal ready or to keep an appointment. Be ready to say something kind and understanding. Your sympathy will shine out of your face and they will love you for it. If they have any money, they'll give it to you. Well, said Peggy, I'll certainly try your plan. I can hardly wait till tomorrow. Next evening, Peggy came hurrying into the house, bursting with excitement. Grandma, she called, look what I got today. I followed your advice and it worked. At this, she held out her collecting box, which was full to the top. I went to one house, she said, and an old lady came to the door. She was hobbling on a stick and looked very sick. I smiled at her and said I was sorry she wasn't feeling well and hoped she would soon feel better. I then asked her if there was anything I could do for her. And what do you suppose, she said. I don't know, said Grandma. The old lady said, it's nice to have someone show up with a smile on their face to put me in a good mood. But what do you suppose she did, said Peggy. Well, she got her purse and turned it upside down, filling my hands with money. Wonderful, said Grandma. I can see you have the right idea at last. That's why it's always important to have a smile on your face whenever you're meeting new people.
Now I'd like to invite Daniel and Yubinko up for our weekly prayers where we pray for the families in this church. So uh, all church can stand up uh, while we pray. Thanks. So this week we'll be praying for families, uh, Kosta and Novich in Kruyas? Yes. yes. Okay. So I'll do it in English first, then Lubinko will be second. So we'll bow our heads. Lord, for these two families, we pray and we come together. Lord, like the Bible says, uh, like you taught, like Paul taught, uh, we are one body. Uh, there is one faith, one Lord, one baptism. We are all baptized into the one body as one family in Christ, for we are sons and daughters of God, and therefore, as family, uh, if one part of the body is hurting, um, we all hurt, so therefore we all look after one, one another, we all care about each other, and uh, like Jesus, um, when he saw the multitudes and they were all hungry, it said the Lord had compassion on them, so our Lord, likewise, um, through the Spirit, we should also have compassion and be caring and love one another, have joy with one another like the fruits of the Spirit, so we just pray for these two families here and that uh, we pray that as one body we are all united in Christ and also that we have the blessed hope that one day we are waiting for the redemption of our body so that even though in life we might get sick or feel discouraged um, at the end of the line like the Lord said and like Paul said um, don't be afraid don't be ashamed for uh, the dead in Christ shall rise and we who are alive and remain shall meet the Lord in the air and this is our blessed hope. So, uh, in these things we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Naš veliki oče i Bože, mi smo ti od srca zahvalni što kao crkva, kao familija možemo da se molimo i subotu u subotu jedni za druge. I oboga jutra, gospode, naše molitve su upućene prestolom milosti za naše drage i mile sestru Kosadinović Radu, kao i za familiju Kruljac, da i gospode blagostaviš i pomogneš im u njihovim životima. Pomozi im mentalno, psihički, fizički, na sve moguće načine, Pomozi im, dobri oče, da bi tebi bili vjerni i da bi mogli da poju svetu i pravednu i lijepu istinu propovjedaju. Pomozi, gospode, da bi mogli da budu tvoji vjerni svjedoci i da bi do kraja bili tebi vjerni i da bi bili spremni za onaj slavni dan i dolaz za gospoda Isusa Hrista. Neka tvoja volja bude nad njima, nad njihovim domovima, njihovim milima i dragima. Od svih nas primi zahvalnost i molitvu u imenu Hristovom. Amin. Now I'd like to invite the worship team up as we sing Redeemed.
Now I'd like to invite Tim up for the sermon. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. Uh, for today's message, as you can see up on the screen, I've decided to talk about artificial intelligence, or I'm going to be calling it AI for short to save my tongue a little bit this morning. Um, we live in a day and age where advancements in technology dominate every aspect of our lives. Um, and it's one of the most impressive and perhaps powerful breakthroughs that we have in recent years is with AI itself. Um, and this comes through from self-driving cars to virtual assistants and so on and so forth. Um, but the questions arise, these implications on our life. So we're going to answer some questions. What is AI? Does the Bible say anything about it? Um, why are some technology experts standing the alarm and warning us against the rise of AI? And how AI can possibly fulfill Bible prof prophecy? So let's start with the definition of AI. <clears throat> The theory and development of computer systems able to perform tasks normally requiring human intelligence, such as visual perception, speech recognition, decision making, and translation <coughs> excuse me, between languages. Now, let's have a short history on AI. 1997, IBM develops Deep Blue. Um, and Deep Blue beat the world chess champion, becoming the first program to beat a human chess champion. So you can see on the right, the guy is inputting the computer's programs, and the guy on the left is the human player. Um, and you can see he's having a hard time. He's hating his life right there. 2002, we have the first Roomba, so a robot vacuum that can vacuum your house by itself. 2010, Siri is released. So when first Siri was released, it was pretty poor quality. It didn't really do much, but now it's pretty powerful. You ask it anything, and it can do it for you. 2011, another invention by IBM is IBM Watson. So IBM Watson is a computer system capable of answering questions posed in natural language. It went on to compete on this game show, uh, the Jeopardy game show, which the Jeopardy game show is just really sort of like a trivia or quiz game show. And it went against these two reigning champions. They were probably one of the two best players um, in the history of the show, and they got absolutely destroyed. Alexa was released in 2014, another virtual assistant, but this one was more integrated in your daily life in the terms of home life and having... Um, infinite real-world capabilities, able to turn on your lights in the house or unlock a front door, so on and so forth. Now, this one is pretty interesting, pretty a little bit scary. Uh, 2016, Sophia is a social humanoid robot that was granted Saudi Arabian citizenship. So the first robot to gain citizenship. And many of us will know this one, ChatGPT 2020, it was initially released, um, but just a year or two ago, a more capable version was just released. Um, and really, a chat, you type anything in it, and it gives you an answer back. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Now, this one, I don't know if people have seen uh, this. Uh, the company figure releases a demonstration of a humanoid robot, um, and it's the first of its kind. And their claim is, is uh, we'll see in this video, that it's unaltered and real-time. So I've just shortened this video a little bit, um, but we're going to see what this humanoid can do. And I'm just going to give you a definition of humanoid. Um, it's something having an appearance or character resembling that of a human. So if you pay attention to the screen, we'll play this video now. the sound. Sure thing.
Great. Can you explain why you did what you just did while you pick up this trash? On it. So I gave you the apple because it's the only uh, edible item I could provide you with from the table. Great, so based on the scene right now, where do you think the dishes in front of you go next? The dishes on the table, like that plate and cup, are likely to go into the drying rack next. Great, can you put them there? Of course. All right, so how do you think you did? I, I think I did pretty well. The apple found its new owner, the trash is gone, and the tableware is right where it belongs. I agree. Thanks, figure one. You're welcome. If there's anything else you need help with, just let me know. Hey, figure one, what do you see right now? All right, we're gonna stop the video. I see a red apple on a plate in the center of the table, a dry... So, after seeing this robot and how human-like it did the tasks and had a conversation. Um, some of us were impressed, excited, maybe a little bit more scared. Um, if you weren't looking closely, there's a, I won't talk about it now, but there's a lot of little details in that video. If you rewatch it at home, there's a lot of little details that shows this is first of its kind and it's, it's extraordinary. So the company, again, claims that this robot isn't being operated by anyone and it's able to carry out full conversations with people and respond to external environmental factors, whatever it may be. And this is one of the primary differences between this one and the other robots we may have seen. Now, according to this company figure, their mission, to expand human capabilities through advanced AI. And how do they aim to do this? So this is off their website. They're specifically targeting the labor force. According to figure, the labor force is shrinking they mentioned that there are 10 million unfilled jobs in the United States. Seven million of these job openings are for essential roles, such as warehouse, transportation, and retail. But there are only six million people available um, to fill these positions. So warehouse suppliers predict they will run out of people to hire by 2024. Now they quote, as we reach the upper limits of our uh, production capability, humanoids will join the workforce with the ability to think, learn, and interact with their environment safely alongside. Now these photos here, they look pretty real, they look like real people. I mean, the guy from the second top, not really the bottom right corner, but these are generated by AI. These people don't actually exist. So these are generated using AI, so that's, Another thing there. Now this amazing artwork looks like it's done by a human, done by AI. And this won a competition. And the controversial thing was, instead of celebrating the achievement, a lot of artists were very angry because it was done by AI. Here's another one. This one was done by AI as well, and this one an award. And this was very, a lot of controversy about this one because it, almost, it looks real. Um, looks like a real vintage photo. Now this one, when this one first came out, I thought this was actually real, but then this is uh, this during COVID, the Pope wearing uh, like a big puffer vest, kind of funny. Um, so people can use AI to generate images of any person, especially famous people. Now, this fooled quite a few people. This photo as well, Trump getting arrested, this is generated by AI as well, and this fooled a lot of people on social media, because they, they look so real, and if you, you have to examine the photos very close, closely to see if they're fake, and even then, sometimes you can't tell. So the creative of AI doesn't even stop there. So we talked about ChatGPT, um, and it's an AI language model that you give answers based on the prompt, that gives you answers on the, based on the answers you give. So I went and gave it instructions. Write me a short poem that rhymes about Seventh-day Adventists. Um, and I'll just read a little bit. It said, in a world where faith intertwines with light, Seventh-day Adventists seek what's right. With the Sabbath at the heart of their creed, they rest and worship as the scripture decreed. I don't know how well Lebinko's going to be able to translate that one to rhyme, but um, it goes more, there's quite a few more paragraphs, and it made me think, it generated this four or five paragraphs within five seconds. Now, our brother, 
Dennis here, he's good at making poems. I saw one, he, he did one on Facebook. For our brother Dennis to make this poem, it would take him at least an hour or two, at least. And with AI, this was done in a matter of a few seconds. So as impressive as AI is, more and more people are seeing not just its benefits, but also its risks. So when people first said AI is a threat to human civilization, I didn't really think much of it. Um, I think people are probably overreacting, but now as time passes by, I can see where these concerns are coming from. Just a year ago, more than a thousand leaders, researchers, individuals in the field of technology uh, signed an open letter that talks about how AI can potentially put society and humanity in general at risk. And one of them being Elon Musk, which is quite ironic because he was one of the co-founders of OpenAI, which OpenAI created ChatGPT, but he left the company in 2018. Now, there are short, medium, and long-term risks that AI poses. Now, in the short term, AI can generate biased, false, and toxic information. And this one is one we have to be very careful of. Um, in the medium term, AI is a job killer. For many years, we thought that AI would only replace a few maybe blue-collar jobs, but today we're seeing that AI can be used in the creative field, affecting the jobs of artists, writers, and entertainers. Now, here's a few examples of a few famous people that AI has used to recreate. So, one with John Lennon, they recreated his voice using AI, one of the albums, and a few of these others, some are holograms, some are just in movies, so, and they look very real. Um, so, they recreate people that are basically dead, uh, replicate famous people, and they star in movies, shows, and they can make them look younger or older. Um, and only a few months ago, all our famous actors went on strike for 118 days because of the risk of them losing their jobs to AI in the near future. Now, if we think uh, uh, about the short and medium-term risks, risks, they're already gloomy. Um, now, let's think about the long-term risks. Some experts say that AI may become out of control and take over humanity, while others say that's unlikely to happen. So why do some people say that AI is dangerous? Well, for one, it's because the vast data that AI analyzes, they may learn unexpected behavior. Now, the real danger happens when AI can create their own computer code, which basically means they write their own instruction. They say it's only a matter of time before AI can write codes that could lead to dangerous outcomes. Now, the frightening thing is here that all these tech companies are racing with each other to create the best AI in the world. Now, they obviously want to do the best to outdo each other to become the leading company in AI. Now, many will be motivated by greed and ambition to the point that they will dismiss the possible ethical dilemma of AI. And the perfect example is here, Microsoft. Just a year ago, Microsoft is partnered with OpenAI, which OpenAI uh, has created ChatGPT. They laid off their team of 10,000 employees that taught um, how to make AI tools to be used responsibly, so ethics and society team. So 10,000 gone like that, poof in the dust. Now, in a world first, we have achieved mind reading capabilities with AI. The University of Technology in Sydney have developed a portable, non-invasive system that can decode silent thoughts and turn them into text. Now, if you didn't think it could get worse, it can. This man here, formerly known as Facebook, but now their company is called Meta, has invented mind reading, but not of text, but visual representations in our brain. Now, using a technology called MEG, I won't go too deep, it's pretty scientific, but basically it's a non-invasive, another non-invasive uh, neuroimaging technique in which thousands of brain activity measurements are taken per second. And they showcase an AI system that can decode that into visual representations in the brain. Now this can be all deployed in real time um, 
And the image perceived and processed by the brain at each instant can reconstruct it. So, I have a little example here. So it's not perfect. So the image on the left is what they saw, and then the, the predicted image is what the AI got out of their brain. So it's not perfect, but it's very close. The basis is there. And this is only early days. This is only a few months ago. It's just going to continue to improve and improve and improve. So this technology is challenging, but the potential could be vast. For the instant, it could help those that, uh, who are mentally conscious but unable to speak or communicate. But on the other flip of the coin, this could be a catastrophe for our privacy. So we need to imagine Facebook or Google, who, by the way, are known not to care about our privacy, being able to know what you're looking at and what you're even thinking in order to better target the advertising or sway public opinion in one way or another, who knows what this technology will involve into the next few years. Now, to describe a truly powerful AI system, they, made, they coined the term God-like AI. So a God-like AI is basically what it, what it says, is an AI like God. It's a super intelligent computer that, computer that can learn and develop new systems automatically without any need for supervision. Now, we're very far from this stage. It's not even anything on paper. But with the advancements in recent years, will it be possible soon? Now, the Bible is quite accurate. We're going to read here in Daniel 12.4. And all the verses should be up here on the screen that I'm going to be reading today. Um, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Now, this is talking about the end times. We cannot doubt we are living in the world where knowledge has increased by an astonishing amount. Now, how big is the information we have now? So I'll give you some estimates. Now, they estimate... Estimate, in 1900, knowledge doubled every 100 years, so every century. Then in 1945, knowledge doubled every 25 years. Now, people at that time were already impressed with the rapid advancements in knowledge. Now, in 1982, it doubled every 12 to 13 months. So that, that's quite a bit. Now, does anyone maybe have a prediction what now in 2020... How often does knowledge double? Every 11 to 12 hours. And that's in 2020 it was predicted. So now with AI giving more of a push, it's probably even less now. So now when the Bible says knowledge will increase, it surely does increase. And the growth is beyond our wildest imagination. And these statistics are pretty fascinating um, and scary at the same time. Now, in the middle of this information explosion, the Apostle Paul mentioned in 2 Timothy, uh, chapter 3, verse 7, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Sadly, really, that's what's happening now. With this explosion of knowledge and information, one would expect the people would become wiser and would have a better chance of knowing the truth. Yet we see... Uh, the rise of fake news, lies, and false doctrines in this ocean of information that we have. And most people really don't even know the basic truths that we have in the Bible. Now, one of the most intriguing questions I had was, uh, what is the role of AI in the fulfillment of Bible prophecy? Um, we don't read the exact, exact term in, in the Bible of AI, but maybe Bible prophecy might give us a clue. So in Revelation chapter 13, verse 14, uh, we read, Because of the signs, it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast. It deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them... Oh, sorry. I'll read from the screen because this translation is different. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. We can see here that the second beast will command people to create an image of the beast. Now, 
The Greek word for image here is icon, where we derive the English word icon um, from the dictionary. It defines as likeness, statue, or rep representation. Um, and the book of Revelation says to make an image. So this tells us that an image is created object. Could it be that people will use AI to create this image? Now, just the next verse, 15. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast and that, that, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Could this image be in the form of a robot fused with the power of a god like AI? Now, we don't know, but I always wonder how current and future technologies would play a role in the fulfillment of prophecy. Now, this is just speculation of how Bible prophecy would take shape. But we can't deny the fact that Satan can potentially use AI to control people and make them worship a false god. Now, we need to look at these signs of AI. Together they paint an accurate portrait of the current state of the world. We reveal that we're in a warfare with Satan uh, that is waging against us or against Christ. We need to notice that much of the signs spotlights are deceptions and distractions. We, we need to realize that radios, televisions, computers, the internet, were all developed just in the 20th century, in only a century and a half. We've gone from the invention of a telephone to having a smartphone in over 80% over of the world's hands. Or the travel industry. 6,000 years, the fastest mode of transport was a horse. Now, travellers can travel the world in mere days, on a plane or even on a car. Um, so some people have even flown to space as well. The devil is really mounting an overwhelming offensive to turn the people's hearts from their creator. But while the devil's tricks of the trades are going every which way, notice that there is one sign that is really never changing and never failing. It is God's straight and true path to salvation, and it's the gospel to the world. Without the hope in God, it is so easy to be afraid and depressed. Thankfully, we can place our faith in God no matter what happens in this life, no matter how modern technology changes the way that we live or how we fulfill prophecies, we can all have peace in God. We can read in John 16, chapter 16, verse 33, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So in this verse we read that we don't get peace from this world. We don't get peace from our job, from our properties, from our money. We don't get it from other people. We get our peace from Jesus Christ. Now, in this world, we will have trouble. Um, now, that's scary, but thankfully, that's not how this statement ends. It says, be of good cheer. Christ knew that we need encouragement. Because this world can be very chaotic and messy, as we near the end of human rule, um, this is just what we need. Now, with AI bringing so much knowledge to our world, the real question is not whether the second coming is near, but will you accept the gospel truth in the short term before Christ uh, returns? Now, how a person responds to these signs of the times indicates his, his outcome in the final judgment. And we can read this in Matthew 24, 44. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Now, on that final day, Christ will already have his reward for you. Eternal life or eternal death, the time is to choose that reward is now. So brothers and sisters, let us not fear that we can go through this world with courage, knowing that Jesus has already conquered 
and overcome the world, we can have full confidence, no matter what happens now and in the future, that there, that there is a happy ending. And that one day Jesus will establish his Father's, Father's kingdom on this earth. Amen. For the wonderful message, now we will sing Work for the Night is Coming. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this privilege, Lord, to share this message, uh, your message with the church, Lord. Lord, I just pray for each and every one of us, Lord, like this song we just sang, that we may work for the night is coming, Lord. Lord, I pray for each and every one of us in our daily lives, Lord, that we can live our lives with you, Lord. I pray this in your heavenly name. Amen.